Let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here this morning. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for, for, for providing us with the opportunity to have a relationship with you. Father, uh, please forgive us as we as we do the things sometimes that we should not be doing. I pray, Father, that you would uh, encourage us, lift us up as children, and remember, Father, that we're flawed and that we are that we are broken and that we need to, and that we need you uh, to build us and make us into who we need, are to be. Father, I pray for Glenn in that situation. I pray that you be with his doctors in that situation as well, Father, that that you help him to get better. Uh, I pray, Father, for Gary and, and their situation this morning as they go to the doctor and get uh, uh, things getting ready for his his knee replacement. And I just pray that you be with them and keep them safe and watch over them, Father, as they travel. Uh, Father, you know we've had a lot of deaths in, in the fam in the in this family and with our with our friends and our and our family members. And I just pray, Father, you be with each one of us. I think Stormy's mom di has died, and I pray for her and pray for that situation. Uh, Alan lost his sister. Uh, LD is gone. Glenn Dory's we did yesterday. And I just pray that you continue to, to, to remember us, Father, and continue to, to strengthen us as we move forward. Help us as we worship this morning. Uh, give us a clear insight as we as we worship this morning and help us as we study help us to learn and grow and give us the courage father to apply these things to our lives and it's in Jesus name we pray amen we're going to be in first Thessalonians if you're watching us online we thank you for your that, that you're watching uh, I had someone come up to me the other day at LD's funeral and said and tap me on the back and said I just want to let you know that I watched your I watched your Sunday morning class and that one last Sunday was right on point and I said wow I looked at her and I said, "Man, I'm glad somebody even cared to watch." You know, but but uh, she was uh, she was very adamant how much she enjoyed the class, so uh, it was good. So anyway, uh, you know, uh, again, something else too. Uh, 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 please pray for the Mussers, uh, Jim and Dolores. I know I noticed that they're. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna be here this morning. Uh, Cole and I went to see him last Monday, and, and we have a study with him every every Monday now. So we're going to be studying with, with him on, on Monday mornings. So uh, where they were good, good that they're here then. Cause, cause he, he had had, had some real struggles with his, with his respiratory thing. And, and, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, so anyway, we're going to be, just be praying for that as well. And, and Mark and Ann are on their way to Fortran. They're going to Fortran this morning. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't, Robert, are you going anywhere today? Are you going to Vanderbilt or anywhere? Not today, huh? Not that you know of. <laughs> so, and uh, and and Cole is leading singing. So, you know, it's a uh, hey, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, if you look around, we have five song leaders. They're all gone. All gone. It couldn't happen on a better weekend because I was supposed to be preaching anyway. So, so we didn't have to. We didn't because they weren't going to get me lead singing. That was for sure. Yeah, you know, we we do it. We do recorded stuff. I was be singing. So, uh, so anyway, uh, again, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. And and if you need us, there's a thing on the bottom of the screen. If you if you need to get us get a hold of us, you can get a hold of us through all kinds of means. So, uh, we thank you. Uh, Paul and Timothy and Silas have walked into Thessalonica, and they've come from Philippi, which was a which was pretty chaotic for them in Philippi. And uh, and they came in and taught the gospel to a to a, a nation or a town of people who were no Christians there. They were they were uh, uh, I guess you know because of the problems he's going to have there. There was a there was a lot of opposition, but he he came in and taught them taught the gospel with the Holy Spirit's help and with great conviction. It says, and and these people were converted, and it converted them, and it began to transform their lives. And we're going to pick this up in verse seven, because I want to read. I want to. I want us to look from at seven, eight, nine, and ten, and we're gonna we're gonna finish this chapter. But I want I want you to look at a couple of things. All right. First off, is the is the model that they became as a church. All right. And I'm gonna and we're gonna talk about that some and what kind of model we are, what kind of pattern we are. Uh, but let me read it first, and then we'll start looking at it. Look at ch chapter one, verse seven. And so you became a model to the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. I mean, your, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to, and to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. 
Okay, I want to I want to go back to to that that word model is is a it's a standard. It's, it was the word two post, and it means a pattern. It's like if you when you when y'all remember when George used to sew all the time, and she would sew dresses and stuff, and she would use a pattern. And, uh, and and she'd have this thing laid out all over her sewing room floor, and it would be all all pinned together. And it was and and you you as you put these pieces together, they became something. I could never have done it. Uh, give me a motor and lay the pieces all out over the place, and I'll figure out where they go, and I'll put it together, and it'll run. But she could do that, and and I know many of you could do that. But it was the pattern was you could see through this pattern, and you could and you know it was it was where you could see through it. Well, that's the idea here. These are, they were a model to the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. And I want to take you to a place. Uh, I want to take you to, uh, well, we'll get there in a minute. But I want, we're going to go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in just a second. We're going to read something there. But uh, I want to ask you a couple questions first before we do that. Okay. Uh, these folks were like a blueprint for others throughout the region to build their, to build their lives on. As a church, not as individuals, but as a church, it became that as a church. And I want to ask you, uh, what can, how can we become a model or blueprint for others? Tell me how that can work for us. And we're going to look at what they did, some of the things they did. We're going to look at the growing of their faith. We're going to look at, at those things. We're going to talk about their repentance. You know, these things, this, this traveled everywhere. And remember, you know, they didn't just, you know, Paul and Ty, Timothy and Silas didn't have an easy go there. They had a tough time in, in Thessalonica. You know, they had arrested some people. Put them, you know, tried to find Paul. They had to hide them. I mean, it was it was a tough go. It wasn't anything like what we might experience. But, you know, and it says these people were so converted, so transformed, that their reputation started to go out of the way. And we'll look at something in a minute, what 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 they did. But how can how can we do that? How do you think that we can become as a church? How can we become a model? Or a pattern for other places to emulate. David? Giving examples. Giving an example? Yeah. Okay. All right. Give me the, give me a give me something. Give me something. Give me something that you, you could say, okay, this could become a model for other places. Mm -hmm. Church is known for being very generous. We're this church here, but we are too. Very generous. Very okay. Generous. Show the love. Huh? Show the love. Show the love we have? Yes. Okay. How do you do that? By 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 your conduct. Okay, by your conduct. Okay. Yeah. An example would be when the hurricane came through here, and we did all that relief effort. Here. Mm -hmm. All the stuff that we did for the various people. With, I mean, it was all given. Let let I'm, and I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. How does your reputation stack up in town or in around, and why is it? Your reputation as an individual, why is it that way? Okay, what did you do in your reputation as an individual? Yeah. Well, like me and Timmy, everywhere we go, we're always spreading the word. And it's okay, like okay. Or, All right. We're handing out cards. If, you're, if you are a low-down, stinking louse, your reputation will precede you. If you're a really good guy, a really good individual, that also will precede you. People will talk about you. The worst, the worst advertising you can get as a business owner is one word of mouth bad advertising. You can put, you can spend all the money you want, and that one louse that, that says something that may not be true, everybody's gonna believe it. So, how did your reputation? You know, I had a sign in my shop, and I, and it was a sign, and it said, "No profanity. God doesn't like it, neither do I." And I'd have somebody come in, and I wouldn't even have to say anything. I just walk in and I'd start. I'd stand right by my my, my desk, and and they had to see me. They had to see that sign. They had to. They couldn't miss it. And I'd stand right under the sign. I didn't have to say a word. And a guy who'd be just one word after another, and pretty soon you'd catch him. He'd get less and less. And then uh, two or three times later, he would come in, and he knew. Don't talk like that in this place. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to that. So my reputation about that started to go get out. Okay. Show you know, respect. To other show people. respect. You know, we we came yesterday. There was about twenty five people at Glenn Dory saying. I know most of y'all didn't know him. I didn't expect a bunch of people, but you know what did happen? There was almost as many of us as there was of them. That will get out there. Okay. 
that family will be, you know, we let the, that they came and used this, this building, didn't cost them a dime. Didn't cost them anything. That, that impresses people, okay? You know, we had, we had the LD's funeral here, and these guys, these guys are, are working, Mark and, and Georgia and Lee, man, work, you know, we were up here cleaning after that, you know, for a while. I mean, so didn't, didn't cost them anything. You know what? They appreciate that. Our reputation as a church goes out from that kind of stuff. We're going to start going to the food bank. You know what kind of reputation we had before because of the food bank before? When we used to go all the time? They knew us. They, if they heard about one of us, you know, the guy, the, a guy called me the other day, and his guy named Robert. <laughs> and he's a guy from Rosewood. And, and he knows us. Because we've, we've been involved, my family's been involved with him so many times, and he's been involved in this church so many times. Cole, his, he knows, Cole has said, and I've told him, if you need somebody to preach a funeral, call one of us. We will find somebody. And he knows he can do that. And so, you know, they, 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 they wanted the building open. I told him when I'd be here and everything. And, and so we opened the building for him, and he's just gushing on us, just gushing. You know, he, and, and his wife said, he said, you guys are, are head and shoulders up here. They deal with all kinds of churches all the time. You know what kind of stuff they may get? I don't know. He didn't, I, we didn't talk about it. But I, I wanted to make sure they knew who we are. What are we as a church? And we can model ourselves and become the pattern for other places like that. You know, where we do, we step out as a church, as a leadership, as, a, as just membership, that we, that we become the people that God created us to be. We transformed into that. So, uh, how can how they said that the message rang out from how can the message ring out from us? How can we do that? You know, Pam just said it a while ago. Everywhere they go, they talk about it. You know, Mark and 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 uh, and Ann were at at a guy's place doing some wiring work yesterday, and they were asking him questions, questions that I can't get them to ask me. Okay, and Brian was asking them questions about about the Bible and about Noah's Ark, and and Mark, you know, and I said maybe. Maybe Mark is going to be the one that's going to fulfill what Harrison wanted us to do. Yep, I don't know. But you see, you know, how can we how can we let the message ring out? Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. Always. That's not as a church, that is individuals. You always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. If they don't see any hope in you, guess what they're not going to ask you? Guess what they won't ask? They won't ask you for an answer. They already got that. They are hopeless, despondent, depressed, filled up with grief and misery, taking pill after pill or drinking drink after drink, trying to fix themselves. They need to see something different in us. Okay? They're never going to ask if they don't see it in you. If, you if, if there's been loss in your life or there's been you know the loss of job, whatever it is, whatever, and they see that written all over your face all the time, guess what they're not going to do? They're going to ask you for help when it's written all over their face. Yes, ma'am. To different ministries that we're involved in, reach out to different kinds of people. If we just have one lane, we miss all those people. You're absolutely right, Tashan. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't have said it better. You know, we've got the food bank thing kicking off now. They're going to start putting teams together for the food bank. You know, they've got guys going to the prison, you know, now every every Friday. You know, we've got Bible studies being ha being held during the week. You know, we've got all kinds of things like this. You know, we've got this class, Wednesday night class, and we've got a Wednesday night, you know, podcast that goes out. Y'all guys may never watch it. I, that's fine if you don't. But you know what? There are people that are watching that stuff. And so the message goes out, and we ring out the message all the time. But, you know, you have to be as an individual. What do you have to do? What do you need to do as an individual? You better know what the book says. You better know where your hope comes from. You better know where you're going. You better know why you're not going where the, where they're going, and you better be able to tell them. And if you can't, why can't you? And how is the message going to ring out? Are you going to let all of the, let just us do it? Is that what you're going to do? Or are you going to be prepared when it happens? You know, it, when it happens to you, you know, the worst thing my wife could have done is to live a life contrary to what we were teaching. Because I believe because of her and I together as a team, as a team. We convert her. Her father, her stepfather was converted. Her mom was converted, you know, and other people at Fortran and Hallisville were affected because of it. Because the you know, every time I went to Hallisville, if, if Elvis Johnston found out I was there, guess what was going to happen? 
What do you think is gonna happen, Al? If, I, if he found, he would come over to my father-in-law's house and said, "I thought I knew you were here." He said, "What are you preaching on in the morning?" <laughs> Every time I went there, I got where I didn't let him know I was coming, and he found out. I don't know how you find out. Somebody tell him, and here he'd show up. So I always had to have a sermon ready. You know, you let the message ring out from you. Whatever your talent is, whatever your talent is, make sure you use your talent. And if you don't know what it is, then go look for it. Pray for it. Ask God to help you so that your message, so our message as a, as a community, you know, that we have we have uh, a reputation that's, that, that runs all over the state. Y'all know that? The things we've done. People remember what we did, what you're talking about, about hurricane relief. They're still, we went, Cole and I went to a conference a while back over at Parkway. And a guy in there teaching the class said, I know who you are. I said, I know where you come from. He said, I'm so, and I said, I know who you are. I remember. He said, he was the guy that, he was the guy that was at, at Sun Valley when Dan and I went, how many times we went out there with the trailer and picking up stuff and just loading stuff with a forklift, loaded up, come over here and do, do, do disaster relief during Hurricane Harvey. And he said, he said, you guys, you guys are the bomb. I, I don't think, I think that's what he said. He said, you guys, you guys put your money where your mouth is. You guys do what you're talking about doing. He said, not everybody does that. I went, whoa, wow. You know what? And it wasn't us. It was us. You know, there's still people that comment to me. They were standing in line out there. You know, they were standing in line. Uh, waiting to get come to come in and get served in the foyer. And the foyer was full of people. We we had nine hundred to a thousand people show up that one Saturday, come through the line, and they still remember that. That's how uh, the model goes out. Okay, now. Dan. Yes, ma'am. Another example is when we do the trunk retreat, and it's all free. Yeah. And people are blown away. They try to pay for the food yeah. and they say, "No, it's free." Yeah. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. When she does, when we do the trunk retreat. And everything's free. You know, this church has a budget item in its youth budget. I think it, part of the youth budget is for Trunk or Treat. It's packed out there, yeah. You know, and it and people people want to know how come we're not charging. They try to pay. They go get food. And they try to pay. They try to give them money. You know, I think that one time we, we had a, a kitty there and we had put a can. We put a can out there and said, "Fine, put oh, your money in there if that's what you want to do." We weren't charging anybody because everybody else in town, you know what they do? They charge, they charge by the car load. And they charge by every event that you go to. They charge. You know, we don't. We don't. As a group, we don't. And that gets out there. People know that. You know, what happens? With, will we ever convert? I don't know. That's not what that's not what it's about. What it's about is still letting them see Jesus in a lost and broken, fallen world. Right? Isn't that what it's like? Now, look at what he says. Look at, look at the next thing he says. <clears throat> the Lord's message rang out. From you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Now, let's look at Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. We're going to start in verse one. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, welled up in rich generosity. You know what he's talking about here? You know where Thessalonica is? In Macedonia. That's where they are, all right? And he said, in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Think about it, guys. Severe trials. We already know that because we looked at Acts 17. Severe trial. Jason was already put in jail. One of the leaders in that church. Already put in jail. Paul and them had to, had to jet out the back way. All right? And they, they are, are poor. They're not rich folks. They're poor. Most people you find... Let me tell you, most people that you find that respond to the ringing out of the message, you know who they are? Poor. They're poor folks. They're poor folks. Poor and broke. Poor and broke. You know, rich folks got money they can throw at their problems. Poor folks don't. And so they they listen to the message way more than, than rich folks do. You know, 
and and I'm looking at at this. And I'm saying, you know, and it says they they not they weren't asked to do it. They requested. Look at what he said. He said, for they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their entirely on their own. They did this on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing this service to the Lord's people, and they ex exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then the will of God also to to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to accomplish this act of grace on your part. But you know, and he goes, you know, and I wanted you to see this these churches of Macedonia. That's where Thessalonica is. He talks about it when he said over, over here that their message had rung out. They they had. They had shared their what little they had, they shared with these people and with the church in Jerusalem for the poor folks there, they shared with them. You know, is that not what this church does, guys? And if you don't know we do that, then maybe you need to ask somebody. You know, how much money it goes out from this place and it goes to other places? How much you think you think that happens all the time here, guys? You know, we have supported the, the things going on in Mexico until Glenn has worked it to now where many of those churches are self-sufficient. They don't need our help financially anymore. We still support Freddie. We give him a raise every year. You know, he still we still support him and and we still support, you know, their their people when we we do we have have uh, uh two sunset students or one right now and another one we're going to maybe have, you know, that we pay for every year or for two years. You don't think that gets noticed? People at Sunset and Lubbock know about us because they couldn't find anybody that wanted to do it like we do. Cole said, we just sent our guys, and I told you that, we just sent our guys up to up to, to Lubbock, and we pay for everything. Cole said, you know what they're going to think when, when I get there and they find out, out about this? He said, they're going to be overwhelmed because nobody does that. Nobody. That's how the reputation gets out there, guys. That's how... That the, the, these folks here, the message rang out. People are going to listen to what you have to say when they see what you do. You got it? They're not going to listen to what you say if they don't see what you do. If they see you doing the same garbage they see everybody else doing, they're never going to listen to you. Not a husband, not a wife, not a child. You know, you want to know why children go off the deep? Because mom and daddy singing, Oh, I love Jesus here. And they're living like garbage at home. You know how I know that? Because that's what I was doing. We sing all these funny songs, go out, get about halfway home, and George and I are screaming at each other, wanting to kill each other. And we've got three little boys in the backseat. <laughs> what do you think? Thankfully, we stopped soon enough that it didn't destroy them. Could have. And I watch kids today, and I say, you know what I know is happening? They're singing, Oh, how I love Jesus here. And before they get home, they're screaming at each other. You know, the message doesn't ring out through your children. Doesn't ring out, ring out anywhere if that's what's going on. They're not going to believe what you say if they don't if, if it don't match what you're doing. Okay? And these folks, they were talking it and walking it. They have to see it. They have to see it. If they don't see it, they're not going to listen to it. And kids are the, are, are, I mean, I mean, they're the most impressionable guys. They're gonna, they're gonna imitate what they see you do, not what they hear you say. What they hear you say is gonna go in one ear after the other because they're watching what you're doing. And and then he said, he said, for they themselves report uh, what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What what was happening here? What happened here? These people were being transformed. You remember Romans chapter twelve. Romans chapter twelve and verse two says. Do no do do. I forgot what it, the, how, you, how it starts. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed how by the renewing of your mind. You don't conform. Become too many places and too many people, too many churches. Become just like everybody else. You know what people want? They want different. When they come and looking, they want different. They don't want what they've already had. So what they already had didn't work. They want different. And if we don't give them something, if we don't, they don't see something different in us, what did these people do? Remember, this is a pagan city. He converts people from paganism. What does it mean that they were pagans? 
means they worshipped what? They worshipped other gods, which became idols. They made idols, all right? And they worshiped, And these people turned from the idols. I'm going to tell you, there was a, a story that we did on Friday night just a while back. It was about Naaman. You remember Naaman? Elisha is, uh, is, uh, is the prophet of the day. Not Elijah, but Elisha, his protege, is the prophet of the day. And Naaman is the king, is the, is the commander of the king of the army of Aram. And he has a slave girl that tells him that because of your sick, you need to go see the prophet in Israel. So he does. He's got leprosy. Okay? He's got leprosy. And and he uh uh and he goes to the he goes to uh he goes to uh where where uh, Elisha is. And Elisha tells him just go dip in the Jordan seven times to be healed. And he gets mad. Because he's somebody. And at home, he's somebody. You know, Elisha treats him like he's nobody. And just says, go dip seven times. You know, And and his, one of his guys said, you know, if he told you to do something really special, you'd have done it. You thought nothing about it. But just because he told you this, you know, so he goes and dips seven times. And he's here. His leprosy's gone. It's gone. Okay? And he comes back and he wants to he wants to pay Elisha. And Elisha won't take anything. And he says, well, then please let me do this. Let me take enough dirt that some donkeys can carry. And he said, and please forgive your servant when I am when I if when I have to go into the into the temple of of I forget what the name of the what the name of the temple was. When I have to go into this temple with my master, and he said he bows down and I have to bow down to hold him so he doesn't fall. He said, please forgive me for doing that. Because I know now it's not right. And he said, I want the dirt. So I can always worship in Israel. <laughs> That's transformation. That's transformation. He tells us to do the same thing. Be transformed by the renewing of your heart, of your mind. You let your mind be renewed, transformed into something else. And that's what happened to these people. They left their idols. They were they become became hospitable to somebody that nobody else in town was hospitable to. And he said, and then their message was ringing out. They were telling people. I want to tell this person that, you know, you remember what it was like if you if you were converted from if you were converted from home if you were converted from from uh, outside the outside of of uh, Christianity as such if you were converted from the world from a denominational group in the world okay I was converted at twenty nine from the denom denominational world. Uh, do you know what? Do you remember what that was like? You remember what it was like? What it was like to uh, to experience that, that sense of clean for the first time in your life, the sense of 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 uh, uh, wonderment. I couldn't wait to tell everybody. I wanted everybody to know. I was going to tell the guy at AutoZone. I was going to tell the guy at O'Reilly. I was going to tell everybody. Man, you know what I found? And you know what I found? They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. And I was disappointed. Because I was excited. Man, I had found something and I wanted to tell them. I want to tell everybody. And 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 he said, it says that they turned to God and third, and I and I wrote a question. How did how did how did repentance change your life? How did it change your life? When you came from the world, now I can go to that denominational world and I'm going, I can't believe I bought this. How in the world did I buy this? How in the world did they did they convince me that this was a good idea? Well, because they because they had me from a little boy, and I and I was I was, was vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable. You know, brainwashed. Yeah, brainwashed is a such. But the point is, is that the transformation that happens it transforms us. That's what happened to these people. They were transformed. They became kind to these people in spite of the trials that they're going through. Have you ever have you ever let the outside influences affect how you live your Christian walk. Have you ever done that? I think we all have. Have you? Were you afraid of what somebody's going to say or afraid of what they're going to do, and so you just so you just uh, go with the flow or you yeah. don't say anything or you know? I think the worst is for me is that I went with the flow. You know that I that I became and for a moment what they were, and and so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be singled out. That's happened to all of us, hasn't it? Exactly. How did it feel when that happened? You go to a family member, and you know, or, you know, I had I had specific family members in my life that that uh, uh, 
uh, they knew me since I was a little boy, okay? My, especially my uncle, he knew me since I was a little boy. And, uh, and he treated me pretty rough. You know, he, you know he's, uh, his kids could do whatever, but my mother's kids couldn't. That was me and my brother. You know, he would, he would constantly belittle me and, and, uh, you know, and, and it got to the point where I just, I just couldn't be around him. I just, because, because I started getting as hateful and as angry at him as he was at me. And it wasn't, that wasn't appropriate. You know, it just, it wasn't appropriate for me to, to for me to act like that. You know, he, uh, he, he called me names, you know, not, not ugly, but he called me names to, to recognize that, oh yeah, you're one of those people. You're one of those holy rollers now, aren't you? You know, and I took it as a derogatory term. I mean, at the time, it upset me, it hurt me, because he did it to me in front of my boys. That was worse. You know, but but it it didn't matter. I was 65 years or 60 years old, and I got him on the phone, and he's trying to he's trying to school me on the phone. And I said, I said, Are you kidding me? You, this is still what you're going to do? I said, I'm 60 years old. I didn't just fall off a ton of truck. I've been around a while. I've, I've accomplished some stuff. He was treating me like I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm going, the last time I ever talked to him, I didn't talk to him anymore. I said, I'm done. I'm not talking to him. He's still alive, but I'm not going to talk to him at this point because because I've become like him. You know, it still happens to me. I still become like, I get that anger and that, that, that that's come from this when I was this big. So the best thing for me is to stay away from him. Stay away from him. I can't ring the message out to him. I tried. You know what he told me? Boy, I didn't know you had that in you. What do you mean you know I had me? You called me all these names because you knew from a long time ago that's what I was. Didn't matter. Didn't matter to him. You know, look at what he, what, what he says. And, and he says, and they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That, when you do that, guys, the way that he's talking about here, <coughs> things are different in your life. Okay? You, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk this morning. I'm going to preach this morning. I'm going to preach to folks that uh, they're not sure they're going to heaven this morning. Okay? I'm not going to be talking to the rest of you. You'll learn some stuff, but I'm not going to be really talking to you. And I'll tell you all that when I get up there. But the, the point is, is that, that if I'm a Christian, okay, if I'm not different than they are, then something's wrong. Is it wrong with them? Or is it wrong with me? I just want you to, I just want you to think these Thessalonians can teach us a great deal. They transformed their lives. And it didn't didn't just happen that Thessalonica, the city was affected. It was affecting everywhere that they reached out to. Everybody. You know, and when we when we're involved, when when you're involved up here on a Monday and you're playing the, I mean, you're fixing a toilet, understand something. Somebody from no telling where may show up and it'll affect them, you know, in a in a positive way. I'm telling you. you know, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, everything, if we don't have, if we don't have that mindset about everything we do, these two guys are going to be running the sound booth. Today. You know, Cole's going to be leading singing. You know, if you don't like the way Cole leads singing, you know what I'm going to tell you? Pick up a songbook and stand to post. Okay? Pick up a songbook, stand to post. Get behind the podium and, and lead singing. And, and then we'll have six song leaders instead of five. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, everything we're going to do is to glorify God. And if we're going to do that the way these guys did, we're going to learn from them, it's going to transform our lives. And people are going to look at us and say, man, and we're going to take our tasks that we have to do today, tomorrow, next week, we're going to take it serious. We're going to take it serious knowing that somebody's spirituality may affect, be affected by what we do or do not do. That's what these people are doing. Transformation, conversion, you know, it is not a thing of the past, guys. I think we think that, and that's why most churches... Look the way they do. Yes, ma'am. This is a perfect picture of what repentance yeah. is. Yeah. It's a turning away. If there's no turning away, there's no repentance. If there's no turning away from, from the past, if there's no turning away, okay, if there's none, then there is no repentance. repentance. Got it? When, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to start preaching my sermon. I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I want you to look, I got, I got about four minutes. I want you to look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Yes. Do you believe he's coming back? Yes. Do you believe he's coming back today? Do you believe he's coming back tomorrow? There's some people he will. No. Do we see him? 
Do you, do you, do you believe he's coming back today or tomorrow? Let me tell you something. Amen. Last Monday at 9.30 in the evening, he came back for LD. That's okay. That's came back for LD. I don't know when did Stormy's mom die. Night okay, the, so the that end. day, that night, he came back for her. Your sister died, came back for her. He's coming back for somebody today. Somebody's he's coming back for today. Now, what this is telling me, when he comes back to rescue us from this, from the coming wrath, okay? But didn't he rescue Bobby? Didn't he rescue from the coming wrath? A lot, I've known her a long time. You know, he rescued her a long time ago. She's been faithful as long as I've known her, right? And you know, I remember her when y'all were all at Fortran, and I was going out there with a hundred and some people out there that I was preaching to. You know, that was awesome. And then they split up and went to two churches and, and opened the church back up in Howitzville. And that's where she worshiped in Howitzville. And so, you know, but he's going to come back for somebody. What, is it going to be you? You? How about you? You know, and, and, and you look at this, and he said, and they, they had gotten to the point where they said, now we're waiting. We're waiting. You know, this is a uh I want you I want you to go to chapter five, verse nine, and then and then got uh, uh, look at this one. Chapter five, verse nine. It says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't appoint us to suffer wrath. He didn't appoint us to suffer at the hands of Satan. He didn't he didn't appoint us to suffer wrath at the end. That's not what he appointed us for. All right, and then look at Titus chapter 2, and then I'm going to be through. Verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of our Lord, and our, our, the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who, what are we waiting for? And then look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. What are we waiting for? I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. In the meantime, in the meantime, Matthew, in the meantime, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? I am gonna, I'm going to allow God to transform my life. I'm going to truly repent. And if you haven't been converted, I'm going to let him convert me. And then I'm going to let him transform my life. And I'm going to start that transformation process and I'm going to make sure that everybody in my life knows that something differs. It may not make them very happy with you. I'm telling you, if you come from some of the denominations I came from, man, they were not happy at all. But you know what I found? I found a family here that loved me in spite of that. So, remember, we're going to pick up chapter 2 next week. And I want you to remember that, uh, that he requires conversion. Repentance and conversion and transformation. That's what these people showed. Okay? We'll see you next week. <laughs>